My dear respected brothers in Islam, uh, Alhamdulillah, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me this opportunity to be part of this event. And even to the guests who have arrived today. Yeah, I know there's a football one, but you guys still find some time to come out and sit and to listen to this talk. So before we begin, um, I'd just like to introduce myself. My name is uh, Dawood San. I'm a martial arts teacher from the Wing Chun School. Um, some of you may know my teacher, uh, Abdul Malik McKenzie. He's come here before and done a talk about his revert to Islam and his journey to uh, and how Wing Chun has, uh, uh, you know, made an impact in his life. So today what we're going to be talking about is uh, the situation of our Muslim brothers and sisters in Xinjiang. Okay. And we're going to be talking about uh, a brief history um, about the Xinjiang Muslims and also the future outcome, yeah, the p possible future outcome. And what can we do as an Ummah to, to help these people? So before we begin, um, I would like to just try my best okay, to paint a picture for you to understand a bit about the Chinese culture. Because I myself, I'm Chinese, yeah, as you may have guessed, okay? Uh, I'm not Uyghur, okay? I'm actually a Cantonese. So where I'm from is the southern region of China, yeah? And we speak mainly Cantonese. So in China, there's two dialects, Cantonese and Mandarin. And Mandarin is the most spoken dialect. Uh, so the dialect I speak, if you were to watch uh, the Jackie Chan films, yeah, the Bruce Lee films, they're spoken that language. Okay, um, Hong Kong is uh, also another place that speaks mainly Cantonese. So, with the speak, with talking about China and talking about um, even my own experiences as a revert Muslim, yeah, in, in a Chinese uh, household. Hopefully, these uh, stories will help you, you know, understand a bit more about when we talk about the history of the Uyghur Muslims and the history of China, uh, uh, Islam in China. So um, first, let's talk about similarities, okay? Things that we can identify that are similar to, uh, you know, with Islam and the Chinese culture. So first things first is, if you ever look into um, the way traditional Chinese people, you know, wear their clothing, you can see that they are dressed modestly, they have long clothing, yeah? In, in Cantonese, we call this Changsam. It means to long clothing, okay? And if you look at the Chinese men, traditionally, you see they keep beards, yeah? They wear hats. Uh, and this was like a sign of wisdom, a sign of wisdom. Funny story, when I uh, became Muslim and I started to practice and I started to grow a beard, I had a lot of arguments, a lot of arguments with my family. They used to say to me, why are you, why are you, why are you growing this beard of yours? You look so silly, yeah, take it off, yeah? And I used to counter with them because the thing is with my family, I'm the youngest out of 10, okay? And when you're the youngest out of 10, your opinion doesn't have no weight, <laughs> yeah? You, you, you get ridiculed by your brothers and sisters, the older brothers and sisters. So I used to have to come at them with a different angle. Because if I argue with them, there's, there's no win, yeah? Uh, and I used to say to them, when I used to say things about my beard, I used to say to them like, oh, you know Confucius, right? And we all know Confucius, he's a very famous, well-renowned uh, scholar uh, in China. I said, did he have a beard? Yeah, I think he did, yeah. I used to say things like, what about the, the emperors, the kings? They all had beards, right? And they're like, yeah, they did. And I said, case closed. <laughs> yeah, these are these the stuff that I used to have to do, you know, to, to, to um, counter the, the, the troubles I had being Muslim in a Chinese uh, household. So uh, moving on, um, even our mannerism and, you know, and the way our etiquettes are is very close to Islam as well. You know how we, when we greet each other, you see the Chinese people, when they greet each other, they do their little gestures, they bow and they this and that. Even looking after neighbours, family orientated, these things are very important in, 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 in our, in our you know, Chinese culture. And even in our Chinese culture, there is like... Uh, Great emphasis on the love of a mother. Yeah? And I remember I used to tell my mum the same thing. I said, mum, did you know that in Islam, we have to, I have to love you three times more than dad? 
And he's, she gets really happy. She says, wow, is this true? I said, yes. And then, and I, w- I would say to her that, um, you know, uh, that Jannah, yeah, it's at your feet. I used to say these little things to her just to get her to, to see the good side of Islam, you know. And this is what a lot of the Chinese practices have already in place, to be honest, okay. Um, even when it comes to lineage is important, you know. Like myself, I can trace my family background back 15 generations, okay. Because the uh, naming of the child and, and, un- and knowing where your forefathers are from are very important. And we can see, and even in Islam, this is important as well, knowing our, how our, um, who our ancestors were, that this prophet was from this prophet, traced it all the way back to Adam alayhi salam. And um, stuff like uh, um, seeking knowledge is very important in our, in our culture. Poetry, very important. So like obviously as Muslims we have Quran, isn't it? But with Chinese people they they're big on poetry. Even when they speak sometimes, they just they speak in poetry. They'll say things in like four four or three words in a poetry sentence and it would explain the whole situation with a you know a, with a beginning, a middle and end, just by just narrating certain sentences. So with these uh, similarities, um, you can see that with the Chinese people and Islam, they, they, they can find some common ground. But the only problem is, oh, the only problem is, is uh, it's belief, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, moving on, um, with China, uh, as it stands right now in, uh, in, in, in this day and age, uh, there's about 1.4 billion, yeah? 1.4 billion Chinese. And uh, uh, what, amongst the 1.4 billion Chinese, China has categorized 56 ethnic groups. Okay, and the main dominant ethnic group is the Han Chinese. Okay, and the Han Chinese are basically people like myself, you know, the Chinese that you see uh, in China. And the other 55 uh, ethnic minorities, okay, because the Han Chinese actually take 90% of the population. So the, the other 10% is the minorities. And amongst those 55 minorities, we have two ethnic groups that are Muslim, alhamdulillah. Okay? And one of them are the Uyghur Muslims, and the other one are the Hui Muslims, which I will later talk about as well. Okay? So a little brief, uh, uh, if we're going to talk about uh, the, the, the brief history, uh, sorry, the, the history of Xinjiang, we should also, um, we sh- it's best to talk about it in chronological order because Islam came to China yeah, before Islam came to Xinjiang. Okay? So, round about, I'll say, uh, round about the, the year 600 to 900, which that period is what we call the Tang Dynasty, because in China, uh, each era was ruled by a, 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 an emperor and it was under that name. Um, so the Tang Dynasty was from the year 600 to 900. And during that time, the year 600, this is when the first exposure of Islam, okay, the first exposure of Islam came to the, the, the Chinese people. And it was through traders, traders who used the Silk Road. Okay, and those of you who don't know what the, the Silk Road is, it is a, um, it is a um, trade route, okay? which uh, connects uh, the, the, west, the east to the west, okay? And a lot of people would use this route to go to China, buy silk, take it back to their country and make products out of it. So this is where the first times that Chinese people saw uh, Muslims. And, and at that time, the Muslims who went there to trade, they didn't have no intention to give dawah. They have no intention. They are, the only reason going there was just for business, okay? But, uh, but around about the same time, uh, the Uthman Caliphate was in reign, okay? And Uthman Ridal Anhu, he sent an envoy to China for the purpose of Dawah now, okay? And amongst that group of Muslims who went to China, there was one Sahabi, his name was Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas, who was, who was one of the 10 
uh, sahabas who were given glad tidings of paradise at the, in this world. So, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas, عنه, he actually uh, did a lot of uh, work you know, spreading Islam in the southern region of China. So, in the southern region of China, there's an area called Guangzhou in, in, in Cantonese, or Guangzhou, okay, in the Mandarin. And uh, if you look into the historical Islamic uh, manuscripts, it is recorded that uh, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas yeah, um, built a masjid, yeah, which is still stands today in Guangzhou, called the Huixing Masjid. Okay? In Cantonese, it's Wai Xingji. Now, this masjid is 1,300 years old. Yeah, you can visit it today. And it's, a, it's in the area of Guangzhou. Uh, there is also like remo uh, memorials and tombs of um, uh, the tomb of uh, Saad bin Abi Waqqas. But this is a very controversial topic, yeah, because we don't, um, you know, but we can agree that Saad bin Abi Waqqas did make uh, a, a huge, uh, you know, uh, influence in spreading Islam in China, the southern region of China. Now fast forward to uh, the, the Song Dynasty. Now during this time, there was another influential uh, Muslim uh, by the name of uh, Sol Fei Er. And according to historical texts, that's a phonetic, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's phonetically sounded to, to mean Zubair. Yeah, Sol Fei Er, it sounds like it, isn't it, Zubair? And um, we don't know much about him, but, uh, but according to history, that he led a group okay, uh, of uh, Muslims who were settled in the northern region of China. And the reason why they were settled there, because the, the Song Emperor of that time, he, had, uh, he, he invited uh, 5,000 okay, uh, mercenaries from uh, Bukhara to help him fight against the Liao Empire. And because they were successful in this, the, 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 the Song Emperor saw a lot of value, okay, a lot of um, uh, help that can be taken from the Muslims. So he settled these Muslims there. And amongst that group, that, that was the Amir of that group, was this individual, Sulfate. And at that time, there wasn't really a name given to the Muslims in China, they didn't, because the, the, the way the, the, the Chinese language is, there's no word for Islam or Allah, yeah? So they had to find words that mean and describe, uh, you know, uh, certain subjects. So for example, uh, the word for Allah in Chinese is Zhanju, and that basically means, Zhan means true. Okay, Ju means host or the owner, so the real owner or the real host. So when you say that to the Chinese people, they understand that now. Oh, I know who you're talking about. When you say Janju, they, uh, they know what you're talking about. You're referring to the, the God uh, that the Arabs uh, uh, pray to. You see what I mean? But if you say to them Allah, they won't understand it because it's a comp completely different language. Yeah. So, uh, Sulfur uh, gave the name. Yeah, I gave a name to the Muslims, and that name was the Hui Muslims. The Hui, okay? And in Chinese, Hui means to return. It means to come back. So, you know, nowadays when we say to someone that, who has become Muslim, we say that they have reverted to Islam, yeah? Because they have come back to their original state of belief, okay? So, the, the word Hui was befitting for this, you know, the, the people who have returned. Or oh, the religion of the people who have returned, Hui. Now this was the um, this this is how uh, Islam came to China in you know in the southern region. Now the north region, which is the Uyghur, uh, the the Uyghur Muslim brothers and sisters. Now the history of Xinjiang. Okay, it's first. Let me talk about the um, where the country is. It's actually in between two neighboring countries so it's Kazakhstan on the left and Mongolia on the right and in bang in the middle is uh, Xinjiang but that name wasn't given until later on so during the um, the 1100 
okay, round about that period, still in the same in the Song Dynasty, um, that na the, uh, the nation that occupied that area was a nation called the uh, Karakannid, okay, and they were the they were um, descendants of the family of Khans. So there was a young prince. His name was Satuk Bukhara Khan. Yeah, he. He was he 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 was uh, he was watching uh, near the Silk Road, Muslim traders, okay, doing business and then stopping and praying salah. They see people traveling, yeah, Muslim travelers taking their goods and they will stop by and they will make their salah and then they will continue. And this sight proved very powerful to him. He was struck in with awe by this, and it it it, it sparked his interest. To question about what is this religion, and this was the means of him becoming a Muslim. So, uh, Satuk Bukhara Khan, he became Muslim when he was the age of twelve, age of twelve, yeah, and he was a prince uh, amongst that nation. And what happened was later on in life, uh, he was he was forced to to wage war against his own family, uh, and when he succeeded, this is when the nation. Of, uh, of Karakandid uh, started to, to, to enter into the fold of Islam. SubhanAllah, you know, this is amazing. How many times have you heard that just by the actions of certain Muslims, yeah, it was a means of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taking work from them and, 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 and spreading hidayah to another nation. It's amazing, you know. Even in my, in, in, you know, in my, in my experience, I've seen this so many times. When I first became Muslim, I was also a child. I was only 15. My, my wife became Muslim when she was a child. My sister-in-law, my niece and nephew, they, they all were children. My close friends of mine were, 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 were under the age of 16 when we became Muslim. You know, and today, I, 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 have kids my, I have my own kids, you know, and I'm sure some of you may have you know, young children in your family. And you just look at them, you think, you guys are still young, you don't know nothing, yeah? But you never know when a certain event or something you say or something you do can make such an impact on that child that it, 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 it makes a big difference in his life, yeah? And when I, when I was uh, practicing Islam, uh, in, 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 you know, when I first uh, reverted, we was in school, we was in school. And none of the most majority of the children, they didn't know anything about Dean, because you know, to be honest, we were the eighties children. You know, we we're eighties child, and a lot of our parents, we just they just focus on what we just came to the country. We must make some provision, and they just focused on that. And a lot of the children, they were left alone to their own, you know, accord. And a lot of them, they didn't really practice Dean much. So when we were, when I was, uh, uh, when I became Muslim, I was asking questions. I was like, how do you pray? How do you do this? How do you do that? Because was, it was hard back then. Now we have internet, alhamdulillah. You just type in Google, YouTube, how to pray, how to do this. You get the, the, the answers so quick. But back then there was none of that. You had, everything was sourced from books or people who you knew. So because of that environment that we created, Muslims who wasn't practicing decided Look at this, you know, we just sort ourselves out, <laughs> you know, you got a new Muslim here trying to learn and we got Islam at our front door, we need to fix up. And then even non-Muslims who heard the news, they were coming around saying, what's going on? I heard you converted. I heard you did, you know, what is this? What is so good about this religion? <laughs> and we would talk without the intention, without the intention of, of Dawah, just going, you know, uh, you know, doing our own thing. And I had like close friends, like one brother, yeah, who I still speak to, he's Portuguese. Uh, he was uh, Catholic at that time. And he started asking questions. And Alhamdulillah, he became Muslim, you know. So, uh, you know, do it, you know, use us some, you know, we practicing our deen with sincerity. You know, it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take work from this. Just like the nation of uh, uh, the, the Uyghur Muslim brothers and sisters. The ancestors, yeah, uh, Satuk Bukhara Khan. All it took for him was just to observe these brothers 
praying masjid, uh, sorry, praying, uh, not in the masjid, praying, you know, um, uh, uh, when they were doing their trading. It was enough for, to, for, the, for him to make that decision. So, fast forward now. What's happened is, uh, with, the, with the Uyghur, uh, um, with the with the Uyghur Muslim brothers and sisters in Xinjiang, uh, a lot of them. Well, there's about currently in this uh, in, um, uh, at present there's about ten million in population. They 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 have Turk you know Turkic uh, descendants. There's Turkic descendants, and the 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 Hui Muslims are Persian. They have Persian descendants. So this is the difference between the two. So. With the Uyghurs, they have their own language, they have their own flag, you know, they, they, when, you, when you sit with them and you talk to them, they, they, they look Turkish and they, they, even their language sounds like Turkish, but, they, they, but they, they have their own, you know, their own language and their own culture. Um, they've always been, you know, by themselves in, 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 in Xinjiang. Oh, see, and also I forgot to mention, Xinjiang, that name was given to that area when the Qing dynasty, which is one of the last dynasty to conquer China, okay, they conquered that area and they gave it the name Xinjiang because Xinjiang in Chinese means new territory. That's what it means, all right. And they've been left alone, you know, uh, and to uh, and and through time they've been on and off China's radar. But what's happened is that. The thing is, with, Chi with the Chinese Communist Party, when you are speaking a different language, you have a religion that they don't understand, you have a culture that they don't understand, this, is, this becomes foreign to them. And foreign means they don't have control. And when they don't have control, they can't control the people, they can't control the peace or chaos. So to them, they feel as if they, they need to you know, have that control over Xinjiang. Now, uh, when the 9-11 event happened, yeah, this was China's opportunity, China's excuse to say, okay, if this is happening in America, all right, this is going to happen in China as well. Yeah? So they've, they, 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 they started to claim that they're also victims of global terrorism. And obviously amongst every country or nation, you're always going to get extremists. Okay? So what happened was uh, in 2014, there was a, 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 a terrorist attack uh, amongst the Uyghur people and it, was, and it, it ended up you know, um, hurting and killing a lot of uh, Uyghur you know, uh, and, and the citizens in, in, in Xinjiang. So the government, when this happened, the government decided, okay, it's time for us to take control. So after, since 2012, Okay, since 2012, the China has systematically oppressed the people of Xinjiang by creating a policing state system, whereby when you go into that country, when you go into Xinjiang, there's checkpoints after checkpoints after checkpoints, cameras everywhere, with such advanced technology. You know, 5G technology that they can recognize voice, recognize face. Um, almost every citizen has to hand in their phone and it's scanned through a computer and they download every data that you have and they monitor and even install spyware. So they, they literally have uh, uh, full access to what you say and what you do. And this is the type of... Uh, um, uh, monitoring system that the government has put in place they even even in some Uyghur, uh, most Uyghur households yeah every government official is a, 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 sorry every a family is, 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 is assigned to a government official yeah and that government official will come to your house speak to your children talk about the, 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 the you know the you know the love for the Communist Party the love for China to your kids and you would have to eat with them in the same table and share the same accommodation with them in the same room 
Because the way they think is that if we eat together, share the same accommodation together, then we become united. And at the same time, it, it also filters out for them that if you start to oppose in any way, or if you show any signs of uh, extremism, and to them extremism is our everyday practice as a Muslim. So if you pray five times a day, that's extreme. If you fast in Ramadan, that's extreme. If you, if you even say salam alaikum, that is also extreme. It's basically anything, any excuse that they can say to that, okay, these ones need to be, you know, fervent moment, uh, they, need, uh, f they need to be taken away uh, uh, and, and um, sent to these concentration camps, which I will talk about next. Now, these concentration camps, uh, according to China, according to the government, these are voluntary uh, concentration camps. So the people who are going in there have enrolled themselves voluntarily. All right. This is according to the Chinese government. All right. And that when they go in there, they are re-educated to take away extremist thoughts. So they, when they're there, they're given vocational courses like learning how to sing, learning how to dance, learning how to cook. Uh, um, and, and to learn about the, the Chinese language and the Chinese culture and history. And this is what they're showing you in TV. So if you did a Google search or YouTube, so you see these. But we all know this is just a front. This is, just, you know, because the proof of this is that the actual inmates who have been freed from these camps, they're coming to us with a different story. Okay. And when you go to these camps unexpected, with no, uh, um, with no uh, appointment, you're not allowed to talk to anyone, you're not allowed to uh, video or record anything. And these concentration camps, according to these, uh, vict uh, these victims, they, 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 they torture, okay? Use fear tactics, uh, put you in cells that are overcrowded, all right? F uh, force you to... Uh, um, basically announce your love for the government and, and China before, you know, every morning you, you, they, they make them sing these songs and chant these, these words just to, just to drill it into their heads. And also, they've been given medication right, that, this, that they don't, they're not aware of. So from, uh, uh, for, um, from reports of uh, other um, victims, that one woman, she said that uh, every morning she would have to pull her arm out of the, 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 the hole in the, um, the cell and she would get an injection. And then a couple of weeks later, she never got a period ever again. Yeah. And they and some of them, they take they given these tablets to take to the point where they 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 become so numb. And uh, that they just give in to what whatever the, the, the people are, are, are brainwashing them with. Because think about it, if you're physically abused, mentally, you know, abused, to the point where you just, you're just like a vegetative state. This is what's happening to our Uyghur Muslim brothers in Xinjiang. Now, when the adults are taken in there, okay, and the children are left behind, what happens to the children? The children are taken to these orphanages, yeah, and these orphanages, right, they... They brainwash the children to the point where they don't even remember where they're from. They don't even remember that they're, they're Uyghurs. They, they've lost their mother tongue, their, the language that they speak. Because think about it, you're about four or five. If you've been there for two years and you've been drilled with these speaking the language and learning the, 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 the you know, uh, and been telling that the, the kid children that you must love the government, the government, you must do this, you must do that. They, the children themselves are going to be have no clue and they're just going to be totally brainwashed you know um, there, I've, there was one video when uh, the proof of this is that there was one video that the the father okay who escaped Xinjiang and he's uh, taking refuge in Turkey uh, there was a social media um, um, videos that were been surfacing around of this child in the in the Uyghur camps, 
and he's just like singing, for, you know, uh, songs about the government and saying that his Chinese name is this and that. And the, the father saw this and said, this is my son. I couldn't be, he couldn't believe it. This is my son. What have they done to him? You know, so many broken families, people who, are, you know, had to take refuge in nearby countries like Kazakhstan, um, Uzbekistan and even Turkey just to escape from this, uh, this torment. Now, mentioning all these things, yeah, you would think this, this doesn't make sense because in history, what, you know, what we were talking about, the government or the, the dynasties and the emperors of that time, they always welcomed the Muslims. Yeah? They've welcomed the Muslims. Like, for example, like I mentioned, the, the Song dynasty, how he's invited so many uh, uh, Muslims to settle yeah, in the northern region. The, the, oh yeah, I forgot to mention the, the, the Ming Emperor from the Ming Dynasty. He actually wrote a poem, yeah, a 30, uh, 100 word eulogy of praise about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yeah, and you should actually try to search this poem and read it in the, trans, uh, in the translation yourself. It's amazing. It talks about how the king mentions that these people from the West, yeah, the Arabs from the West, they come and they have their, their intention is to it's nothing but peace. You know, they 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 invite they invite good and forbid evil. They they recite the scriptures that have thirty parts. They um, they pray five times a day. This is what's in the poem, and it's mentioning step by step. And then in the end, it ends with uh, praising Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and 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 the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, with all this, where did it go wrong? How come, after all this, now the government is actually doing the opposite of their ancestors? The opposite of their ancestors, yeah? And, and, and persecuting and, and occupying these, uh, these, these our Uyghur Muslim brothers and sisters. Now, like I said before, you know, the Chinese people, yeah, and the government, the two, you know, they, they, the, the people... Uh, you know, uh, the government doesn't speak for the people and the people don't speak for the government. You know, two different separate things. And I myself, I've been to China. I've been to Guangzhou. The people there are so nice. Yeah? They're very welcoming. This, uh, you know, they're very polite. Very polite people. But obviously what the government does and what the people do are two different things, isn't it? Yeah. So, my dear respected brothers, you know, what what can we do? You know, what, what is the solution? Okay. Um, I would like to recite a hadith to its nearest meaning. You know, once the Prophet Sallallahu said that if you see any evil, you should stop it with your hands. And if you can't do this, then you should at least stop it with your tongue. And if you cannot do this, then you should at least Store of your heart, okay, and this is the lowest level of one's faith. Now, I understand the situation of the Ummah today. Yeah, we have our leaders, they're not going to do anything, yeah, they're not going to stand up to these and physically do anything. So, us as, a, as Muslims who live in the UK, who are able to practice our deen freely, we should be the voices for these Uyghur Muslims. Yeah? where they are silenced. If you look at these videos, it's, it's so creepy. You go, the, the people who are going to Xinjiang to check if it, you know, to, as, as tourists, there's, there's government officials there watching over you. And when you go to speak to a Uyghur, they don't say nothing to you because they're scared. And if you ask them anything, they'll just, say, uh, uh, they'll just praise the, the, the government. You know, they, they've been silenced. We should talk for them. You know, things that we hear today or what we know about or what we research, we should talk. Tell our brothers and sisters, tell our neighbours, tell our friends, tell our colleagues. Spread this. Because the more we talk, this will become viral. And when this happens, it puts pressure. It puts pressure on the, on the, on the oppressors. Look at um, what's happened uh, in the recent year when the George Floyd, he was killed by an officer. Yeah? 
And if it wasn't for the, indivi the, the, the people around that was happening to say something and to use their phones to record as evidence and to pass it on to the world and send it to people, we wouldn't have known about this. And this person, this, this police officer would have been still roaming around free. But the fact that that individual did something by saying something, by letting the people know, it became viral. And then everyone around the world said, enough is enough. Yeah? Enough is enough. We need to do something. We need to stand up. We need to take it to the street. We need to protest. We need to, you know, write about this. And look what's, and what happened in the end? Justice was served. Yeah, that, per, that, that officer was, uh, was, was found guilty and sentenced. It's the same, with, same situation here. If it wasn't for social media, they wouldn't have, and, or any of these um, um, platforms, we wouldn't have known about this. So we need to spread this, we need to talk, we need to you know, um, and continue to, 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 to um, make motions, you know, and hopefully it will put some pressure it will make some changes because I know how it, you know I know how it is. It's hard for us to st stand up and do something right now, but we can talk. So may Allah Subhanahu give us the tawfiq and the understanding, and to may Allah Subhanahu you know uh, ease the situation for our Uyghur Muslim brothers and sisters.